Okay, uh, we're good to go. I hope you guys enjoyed a long weekend, lots of snow. I hope you all went skiing. Whoever didn't go skiing should go skiing. Uh, so today, uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, this interface between the kernel and the process, right? So we mentioned it last time. I said that it's called a system called interface, right? And today, the whole lecture will be dedicated to the to the idea of what this interface should look like, because it's not trivial, right? So as a designer of the operating system, you might choose this interface differently, right? So it has to be driven by some goals, right? And this is what we're going to cover today. So one thing which I wanted to say uh, is uh, last time after the lecture, a couple of people came over and, said, and asked some questions. And those questions were really on point. Those people were very quiet during the lecture, but then they asked the question. I said, okay, why haven't you asked it uh, during the lecture? Because it's beneficial to everyone, right? Uh, I mean, ask, because uh, it really helps everyone. So it's something very obvious to me, so obvious that I even forgot to mention it in the lecture. Something like, how many page tables do you have? Each process has its own page table or, or not, right? So stuff like that. So, but it, it's it's a very, very, it looks like a very trivial question. Confirming this knowledge will, will take you like a couple of hours of reading through the book to make sure that, okay, I understand correctly. There is like one page table per process, right? So it's uh, it's much easier to ask, right? And again, so it's, it's not embarrassing to ask. Uh, okay, back to the main topic, right? So remember last time, so I gave a general introduction about what operating system should look like, right? So it's, uh, and I was trying to convey this idea that in, in general, operating systems are not some crazy, unpredictable beasts, right? So it's, it's whatever you need them to be. So you just say, okay, I want this library. It implements printf for me, and that's fine enough. And uh, maybe some device drivers which abstract some sensors, right? And if we build it like that, we'll end up with something like Adreno, right? And I was programming Adreno over the weekend again for whatever reason, and it was fun. But I, and I don't know much about it, right? But uh, it's usable. It's a operating system, and the usability factor is amazing. So because you say, look, I bought this microcontroller, I bought some sensor, I connected some wires with a soldering iron, which I rarely do. I don't know anything about it. And then you pull up a library and you can read readings from that sensor. And specifically, again, I was using uh, the example which I was, uh, which I mentioned last time. So it was a, a particulate air quality sensor, essentially, PM 2.5 and stuff like that, right? So that's a operating system, right? And then we said, okay, hold on, but uh, what if we have something like a laptop or, or, or a data center or cell phone? So there are some additional requirements which we want. For, uh, or some additional properties, right? So it's not just uh, it's not just uh, about uh, uh, like providing those library like function, but it's also about sharing the CPU. So kind of letting multiple process, multiple programs to uh, to run on the same piece of hardware, and somehow sharing this piece of hardware, taking turns, right? Providing uh, things like file systems and network stack, stuff like that, right? Uh, and something what became more important in recent years, uh, implementing certain security policies. And the most obvious security policy is, well, one program cannot access anything besides maybe a narrow window of the operating system interface, like open some files, maybe not even all files in a file system, right? Because maybe some of them are special, contain some secrets which you don't want to accidentally leak online, right? Okay, so cool. Uh, and I, I put this picture, right? And I said, okay, this is pretty much how any operating system looks today. And I, in my specific examples here, I show that it runs a uh, uh, shell, this dark screen, which you see sometimes in my machine and which we're gonna discuss today in details or, or it's up at, in some level of details and Apache web server. So Apache was, uh, the web server serving web pages like let's say five years ago. Today, probably it's not so true. Everything has changed. You know, no one ever serves uh, web pages anymore. 
But and today's topic, right, is specifically this interface in the middle, the system call interface, right? So this is this, the, the topic of our lecture today, what this interface looks like. So if you build this yellow part, uh, and again, uh, one of the questions which I got asked last time after the lecture, a person showed up and asked, okay, you, you put these pictures on the screen and you say operating system and you put, and you say kernel, like here I say kernel, right? But uh, what is it, an operating system? Is it just a kernel or it's, is it something else as well? So do you guys have an answer to that? There are multiple answers. So just to give you a hint. Operating system versus the kernel. Correct. I agree with that. So look, what your classmate is saying is he's saying, okay, largely when we take a, like, let's say a phone, like we all know how to use a phone, right? We, we scroll like crazy. And we, we say, look, we, we never even think about the, this yellow piece, which is a kernel. Where is it in the Android software stack? It's kind of deep below, so, so deep that we don't even bother. Even if you program web apps or something, right? You usually don't get to the kernel. You program against the GUI level or against some systems libraries, right? And those GUI levels, layers, and system libraries are part of the operating system. And the kernel is just, let's say, the very core part of it. It so happens that in XV6, there is nothing else besides the beside the kernel. So the kernel and the operating system, that's it's the same. There is not, there is no GUI. There is that's why it's it's a little bit simpler, right? But you should, should keep in mind that when you say operating systems, operating system, it uh, it means those, the software stack, which sometimes sits outside of the kernel, and in the modern world, often sits outside of the of the kernel, specifically GUI, right? The most the most uh, important example, right? So just for understanding. Okay, cool. Actually, I was I took my lesson and I I fixed the pointer. Like right now, I don't see the pointer on the screen. I actually did fix it in my office, but somehow it doesn't show up here, uh, no matter what, on, like in this specific situation when I'm sharing the screen, which is surprising, which make, uh, makes my annotations a little bit challenging, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how it works. Okay, so system call interface. So again, you probably in some other classes, you were asked to build a specific library. Maybe it was some kind of a, physics computation, I don't know, some kind of a physical process and you were uh, computing, I don't know what, but outputting a, a, a specific number. And the requirement for this example was, okay, here is the function which you have to implement, right? So let's say it outputs the temperature over a period of time. And uh, that's the interface. The operating system implements a similar interface, right? And again, it's not like just simply calling a function, for security reasons, because sometimes it is, right? So there are, there are kernels, like I claim, like Adreno, in which you simply call a function in a language like C and you get into the kernel uh, or get into the kernel after some layers of libraries. But typically there is a transition, which kind of like implements a security policy, which says, okay, look, you cannot just simply call a function of a kernel or any function of a kernel. You are allowed to only call the subset of the functions which are exported the, by the kernel as, as the system call interface, right? So, and we'll talk a lot about it, right? So I just wanted to make sure that uh, we understand upfront what will happen. So this, again, my yellow part, which is a kernel, and my green part, which is a process, right? So and I, I, there are some technical details which will become clear later. It's not important to understand them now. But if you want to invoke a function in a kernel, you don't directly just invoke a function like it was an assembly uh, jump or call primitive, right? You go through something what is called, let's say, an interrupt. So this int uh, hex 80, right? An interrupt which uh, transitions you towards a hardware-like mechanism, which is an interrupt descriptor table. And then the operating system configures this address here saying, okay, by the way, you're allowed to enter the kernel and start executing from this, from this address. Interrupts is just one way to implement this transition, right? And we will talk a lot about interrupts, so you will understand everything. 
There are some other ways, like sysenters, syscall, and modern CPUs. They are just faster than interrupt, but conceptually they are sort of similar, right? So it doesn't doesn't doesn't. It's not important to understand this right now. I just wanted to to make sure that we understand that the transition is not immediate, like a function. It's at a level of libraries. It will look to you like you're calling a function. It's just underneath there will be some stitching to enter into to, to like change privilege levels and get into this yellow part. Okay, and now got to the point where we really have to answer this question. So we understand, okay, well, there's a kernel, there's a user. If we want to run something useful on top of this operating system, which we are designing, hypothetically, let's imagine that we're all designers today. What are the system calls we need? Okay, great. So we say we need uh, some memory memory management. That's great, right? So you say, look, if I want to run, run a program, I obviously did not explain anything about how memory allocation works or anything, but you kind of intuitively feel that, okay, you need to request more memory, right? Because we said, we, we said multiple programs share the same machine, right? And obviously they share the memory and you cannot give all the memory to, all, to, to a single program. So they probably will request it dynamically, right? In modern languages, it's implemented as constructors or new operators in C++. Uh, there are different primitives, right? So there is a malloc in C, box and Rust, stuff like that, right? So, but underneath that, there will be a system call which goes into the operating system and, and asks, okay, give me more memory, like a page. And I keep mentioning page and it will become later clear what is that unit of page, right? Okay, memory management, good. Uh, Process management, exactly. So we say, look, by the way, if we want some, to run something new, ah, and I click. Okay, so process management. Uh, can you guess what this interface will look like? What What is it you immediately need? Fork? Fork and yield. Well, we immediately get into those bushes of uh, Unix interfaces, right? So fork is very specific to Unix, and I will explain why. And it makes certain sense, and it does make sense in certain, in certain situations. And it does not make that much sense maybe today, but it, it had a lot of sense 30 years ago. But what you mean by fork is probably you wanted to say, we want a way to create a new process, right? Obviously, like... We have one, we maybe want to create another, right? And so obviously then we need a way to terminate it, right, as well. Good, so memory management, process management. You mentioned yield because I was saying that uh, we want to build this. Sometimes we want to be a good citizen and yield the CPU back to another program if we don't have anything to do. Uh, if I ask you a question, what will be this case where you, the program might not have anything to do? Can you guess when? Already waiting for something. Then some some message to other places and waiting for the data to come. So uh, instead of easy waiting, I can see oh I can speak to the process rather. Correct. So sometimes maybe you're waiting for user input. Sometimes uh, um, you might say okay I'm waiting for a network packet. Maybe it's an Apache web server. Surprisingly. And I will probably challenge you asking uh, asking a question whether any of you ever used yield. And the answer should be no. Right? So 99% sure no. If that one person used yield, I, I, I'm curious to hear the use case, right? So anyone yield ever? Yeah, just similar situation. When I use the, the, the CHP service hosting, the one you have the resources function. I instead of working the resource, I will say, oh, it's all my work. Correct. So what you're saying is that in a special use cases where you run a cluster or a data center and you have a specific framework for high performance computing, you say in that setting, yield might be more common. 
In modern operating systems, the reason you don't see yield often because it's hidden from you. So for example, because remember we said, we're waiting for the user input. How do you wait for user input? Typically you're reading some kind of a file or maybe a network socket. And your program actually tries to read the socket and internally inside the operating system kernel, it detects, okay, there is nothing for you yet. And it will do a context switch and yield at this point. But you as a programmer very, very rarely will need yield as a primitive on a modern kernel, right? And as we say, as I was trying to explain uh, last time, modern kernels operate, uh, implement this preemptive multitasking, which means that yield is okay, but really we don't trust anyone to put it correctly anyway. So we're gonna use a timer interrupt and other mechanisms to make sure that we will let you run for a little bit, let your program to run for a little bit, and then we'll take control anyway, right? But sometimes, I mean, I don't think I used, I mean, I used yield in the kernel where it was needed, but I never used, I don't remember using yield in a, in at the user level. Okay, so, but anyway, so other parts of this interface, we have memory management, we have process management. That's pretty cool, right? We're almost there. What else is missing? Typically no, because, uh, and I will explain it today, the input in those systems are, abstracted behind the abstraction of a file. So you kind of open a file and then you try to read from a file and you expect the user to input something. And when I type on a keyboard, it actually goes through a special file, which is not really a file, but it's called a console or well, whatever. Like there are like different terms here, but let's say just console, but really it's a, it's a device driver, which waits for the interrupt. When I really press a key, there will be an interrupt it will reach the kernel and it may, like at some point this kernel says, okay, it will go to this, to this process, right? And, uh, but the process says open a file and it's just a special concept file. Uh, right, so correct. So we also, and I, this, is, this is where I was trying, trying to push you guys. So I was trying to push you towards kind of two missing parts, which I believe are missing at this moment in this discussion are, which are files and the network, right? Again, you can imagine operating systems which never use files or network. Again, my Adrido examples, I haven't yet used file or network. The sensors which I bought and the boards don't have a network, even hardware, right? So there are boards with network hardware. I didn't, just didn't get them yet, maybe. Uh, but, uh, and there are no files. Maybe Adrino has something and I'm just so naive, but there was no need for me to use them, right? Yeah, but I'm pretty sure there are. So this is what we need. We need files just because, I mean, it's a good question why we need files, right? So in some abstract view of the world, you might, as I said, imagine a operating system in which you will never use a file. One good example, which you will probably encounter soon in your professional life is something like a data center. Well, there are no real file system. There are some storage buckets, which you access through some interfaces, you probably know them better than I do, but the file is not central to that system just because it was kind of cumbersome and not super important to implement it, right? So big arrays of storage, that's needed files rarely, right? But there are some like configuration interfaces which allow you to keep your like story of configuration parameters and stuff like that. So you will see systems without file systems, right? But uh, later. Okay, but in, in this like desktops, still conventional uh, server machines, uh, to some degree phones, although you rarely see files on a phone. Yeah, so files are needed and network management is needed, right? And that's why we were gonna talk about it, right? And that's more or less it. There is just one additional piece, which uh, I kind of was mentioning uh, in passing in the past, is a mechanism which is called inter-process communication. It's a one way or another which a operating system provides for multiple processes to communicate with each other. Again, a natural example is a GUI stack, right? So you say, well, well, clearly something is going on. So every program in a system or every which uses a GUI library puts something on a screen and then some other program assembles this all together and actually puts like a picture let's say like this, right? Where one window overlaps another, right? So it comes to those windows, this uh, task manager or whatever this window is called in Mac is 
coming from one process and the background comes from my presentation software, right? So and clearly they somehow managed to send information between each other. And today we're gonna to talk about this one of these examples and it's called the pipe. It's kind of a primitive and slow communication mechanism, but it was one of the first ones as well. And it's sufficient for our x 6 example. Okay, cool. So I have this slide where I kind of enumerate everything, right? But you already, like you already, I think, uh, figured it out. And so we have a decently good outline for how to build this interface. Any questions at this point? All good? Good. Okay. It turns out that uh, the interface of ironically modern operating systems, so let's say everything pre-phone is built about around the abstraction of a shell. This uh, dark screen, which is just a, yet another regular program, which runs on a machine and does something, right? It's historic. I mean, the reasons are historical, right? And if I ask you a question, why? Why would you build an operating system interface which is geared to support this seemingly weird program, which is convenient for me? So I, I run shell. So like I, I can show you here, right? So on, on a daily basis. So if I if I this is like a paper which I'm working about, right? Uh, working on, sorry, uh, which is due in a couple of weeks. And surprisingly, I do develop this paper in shell. Uh, again, it just, I'm not arguing that I'm the best or like do something very, very clever here. It just ergonomically makes sense for me because my workload, like the stuff which I do personally on a daily basis, like writing papers, doing some coding, uh, it still fits well into this abstraction of a shell, right? But it might not fit well, if you do something else, right? If you like building presentations or do some graphic graphic design stuff, right? You will never see shell. Why would you, right? But again, but in some cases, it still makes sense. If I ask you again the question, so why do you think it uh, it it was making so much sense, let's say almost 50 years ago when first Unix machines were designed and this operating system interface, which we're discussing today, today was actually kind of conceived and started like, getting shape, like essentially a couple of guys designed this interface. So why? Actually, I think you're right with these two bullets because, and this is the, this is what I really wanted to hear, right? The thing, I think number one, which you mentioned, actually, I don't know, is it better? You hear me better? I forget to turn on the mic. Is that really, this is how the hardware was looked back, back then, right? So they didn't have GUIs, right? So these two guys, Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, they kind of creators of Unix. So they essentially like, they are trying to program this operating system kernel and the whole ecosystem and you see, there is no GUI. They sit in front of those things. There are no screens yet, right? They have kind of like a thing which prints back on paper what they type, right? So, and then you say, look, oh, that suddenly makes sense. You say, look, uh, imagine this is not a screen, but a, like a piece of paper. I say, alas, or list me all the programs in this folder. And it kind of prints out and I can interact with the machine, right? So the reason really is that back then there was no hardware which was essentially like putting windows on top of an app, each other, right? Maybe it was in some like research labs or people started thinking about it, but it was not commercially available yet, right? And really this is one reason that the shell was essentially designed to support this terminal interface. That was the thing. I asked you again a question, but well, what if I have a, a data center? Maybe it's somewhere else in a different state you still have to access it, right? So like we make the same choices today as well, right? So maybe you're not gonna make a choice of a shell. You will have some JSON API, but it will be sort of shell-like, right? So because you say, well, I can, I can invoke a function and it will return me something, maybe all nodes in the system or all available nodes, right? So stuff like that, right? 
So again, we kind of designed for the hardware. And of course, like uh, systems with uh, graphical user interface or the ones which are heavily centered around graphical user interface are totally different systems, right? And we probably will see something even different very, very soon, like, you know, uh, 3D goggles and stuff like that. So it, it it will change again. But again, back then it was it was totally cool to, to think this way. And later on, the first uh, piece of hardware, this is not actually a computer. This is, uh, this is just a screen with a keyboard and a modem, which was dialing over the phone line to the data center where the real computer was located, right? And so people were sharing access to that machine because the machine was so expensive. The piece of hardware was so expensive that like there was a single Unix machine and a, a bunch of people were connecting from home, home from this from this uh, devices. But again, the interface was still like very simple shell light, right? Okay, so we got the point. This is why we have a shell. And the choice of a shell as a special program which allows you to interact with the machine uh, is kind of clear to us at this point, right? Back then it was making sense, right? So in, in as you say, your second point was it was also designed in such a way that it was providing certain degree of extensibility and composition, right? Meaning that uh, the operating system kernel itself implements system calls, but people write programs which you can invoke from a shell and they will do something useful for you, right? So in this example, for I have LS, which lists all the files, right? Or I have this WC, which essentially it's a word count. So with a flag minus L, it counts all the lines in a file ls.c, right? And you suddenly think, okay, look, I, I, I bought a machine and I suddenly some people write those programs, those tiny programs, which do something useful for me, right? And I can, I can, I can build a workflow and I, I show you mine. So mine is built around this uh, publishing tool, which is called Vladek, right? So I write my papers in text editor, compile them with make, they show up as PDF uh, things and I use like plotting software to build graphs and stuff like that, tables, right? So it still kind of makes sense to me, right? But you, you, you see that this allowed an ecosystem because the shell was a primitive, but a language which you could program. And this is, we're gonna discuss how it was, what was the pro this limited programmability back then, right? Okay, if I ask you a question again, uh, one of those dummy ones, what is a shell, like physically? What is it? Part of the kernel, part of the user? What is it? You say an interface. Conceptually, yes, but not really. So as you, you can imagine a system without a shell completely, right? So imagine, uh, I don't know what it will be. Imagine uh, we're suddenly back to 2004, uh, trying to create Facebook, we said, okay, we need to quickly access a ton of those tiny like stories. The disks are very slow. So if we assemble the newsfeed, it takes us forever. People are annoyed. And we come up with this idea that we will be caching this uh, news items in memory of, let's say, hundreds of machines or maybe thousands of machines because memory is way much faster than disk, at least back then. And it's called memcached, right? So, and they like whatever the technological kind of idea behind enabling Facebook, right? So, if you're running thousands of machines which are doing, and memcached is kind of like a hash table, you distribute it right in, in memory, right? And you say, well, do I really need shell on those machines? Well, maybe, but maybe not really as well, right? So, you can imagine machines or use cases where the shell is not really strictly needed, right? But I agree with you when you say that it's an interface between the kernel and the user, but is it in any way special or not? Yeah. Okay, rare hand, so tell us, yes, no? Uh, right, correct, so it's just a regular program. In many cases, it uh, runs first, or when you boot, it just, the system logs in, logs you in, verifies your credentials, and then starts a shell for you, right? But again, like whoever sees seen a shell on Mac or Windows, right? So never, right? So those guys run without a shell. There are shells though, but like again, this is just again a choice. Like today we don't really need to boot into shell, but back then 
makes sense. But anyway, so no, what I wanted to emphasize is just a normal program and the homework, which I will assign later this week, will be to build a tiny shell, a simple one. But it's a useful exercise. Why? Because I'll tell you, I mean, I'm talking about a burning system interface. And I will try to be as concrete as I can, but really I can only be so concrete, right? And if I assign a, a homework, then you will have to program against this interface. And then you will understand all the design choices those people made, right? So your first homework will be to build a shell, right? And I'm pretty sure that many of you already built shells in previous classes. So how many people did? For you, it will be easy, but I will ask you to build again. One more, maybe a simple one. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good warm up exercise to understand, again, just to understand the interface, why we build it this way. Okay, cool. Uh, so as I just mentioned on a previous slide, it's just shell is just regular program and it interacts with the kernel through system call interfaces, right? And you can build your own shell and say, look, I will be running my own language interpreter or something, right? Like more advanced shell. And there's a bunch of those, right? And it will help me to implement whatever I want to run my daily programs, right? But really, our question today is to kind of understand what is that happens underneath? Like what's inside the shell or what's the nature of the shell? How it interacts with the operating system interface? So what happens when, I mean, when I, when I have it here, uh, this thing, sorry, is called a common prompt, right? So it's like, I have a slightly fancier one. I have this green line which says, puts my name here, says the name of my machine, which I fail to name in any interesting way, shows me the path where I am in the file system, right? And then I can type an X command, something like a last like, right? Or let's say W count, word count uh, in a file, let's say, uh, tech. AXA stands for acknowledgements, right? And it says, okay, look, there are like 26 words in this file, right? It outputs there. So the question is like, what really happens underneath, right? And it's on the screen, but let me just go back to the previous slide so you don't look at it. So what do you think is happening when I type WC in shell? Uh huh. Correct. So you first the shell. What what you're saying is that shell first tries to locate the program which is named WC in my file system, right? To just to say conceptually to start running it. What does it mean to start running? Correct. In a second, we can discuss it, but. Conceptually, what you're saying is that shell creates a new program, WC, right? And it runs it. Uh, it somehow connects this program to my terminal so I can see the output of that program, right? And we will talk about it as well. But conceptually, you're right. This is what I wanted to see, right? So there is a couple of other things. So shell also passes, uh, like it parses this, this string, which I type WC space, dash L, right? So it parses it, it converts into a set of arguments to WC, right? Uh, creates a new WC program process, right? And then waits for it to run with a specific system call wait. And then WC, meanwhile, prints something on my terminal, whatever it needs to print. And sometimes you say, look, it just prints a line, but sometimes some of these programs print more, right? And uh, and then eventually it says, okay, look, I'm done. You, I, I know that WC is done running. It's time for me to print a new command prompt and wait for the next program, right? And that's how people interacted with machines 30 years ago, right? I would even say, again, as I was trying to convince you that sometimes this way of working with your machine is still very efficient, right? It's more efficient than, than clicking buttons, right? Sometimes. Okay, so... Before going into like those, how we start a program, what uh, what it means to like parse arguments and stuff like that, 
let's take a look at the part of the system call interface which implements input and output, right? Because naturally, our end goal, even with the simple programs, is to see some output and maybe interact with a program, right? Okay, so the interface looks like this. So open is a system call. As I said, internally, it uh, uh, uses this interrupt mechanism to enter into the kernel, but conceptually, it looks like that to you as a programmer. So you say, look, open takes a name of a file, ls.c, and some flags to say how this file has to be opened. In this specific example, I say open it read only. You all done it, right? So it looks a little boring at this point. <laughs> open returns a file descriptor, right? So my next question naturally is, what is this file descriptor? Do you guys remember? Well, yeah. Yeah, it's an integer. What's the semantic meaning of this number? What does it represent? Yeah, it, so it's uh, open, so it, it, FT, so it's an uh, FT actually to be an instance or an integration of a file and it's an operating a file, so it is FT. Correct. So again, I will repeat it for everyone. So this number is an index in the array, which is called the array of file descriptor. Here's a picture for you. So operating system maintains this array of integers for each process. So each process will have, have a, its own array. I mean, again, the design choices can be different. So you can abstract this idea differently, but this is how they did it back then. So you say, open me a file, which is called ls.c. Again, there is no pass in a file system. So this part of the operating system will search through the file system and will find where this file is located. And what it will do is just, it create will create certain metadata uh, structures, sorry, inside the kernel, which will represent this file, right? In terms of C, it will be a struct file with some fields, right? It will be allocated on a heap, let's say, right? And this array will contain a pointer to this file data structure, right? Since you cannot give a user program a pointer, because you know, it doesn't make sense. Those ever spaces never overlap, right? Like if you try to access this pointer, the program will crash because the kernel will never uh, let the user to dereference this uh, file object in the kernel directly, right? But they, what they do is say, okay, I will give you a number. And next time you wanna refer and do some operation on this on this file, please give me this number and I will do operation on this number. So it's kind of like, you can think of it as a remote pointer, the pointer which crosses the address spaces, right? And this is the implementation. Again, there are many ways to build this idea and you've probably seen it in other, let's say in distributed systems where you an instance of an object sits on a different machine and you say, look, I have a, some kind of a smart pointer when I pass it into this, uh, API, it will actually access the object from another machine, right? But they did it this way, so that's fine. So this number is actually an index in this array, right? Okay, get it. So, and they also implemented the second idea, this idea of polymorphism. The fact that the object behind this array can be a different thing, not just a file, but as I mentioned before, a console interface or a device driver, which will physically output something on the physical screen, right? For you. Or if you're reading, it can be a keyboard from which you're actually reading, right? So, and also, or if it's something what is called a pipe, this data which I'm writing into this pipe will be available on the other end of the pipe and maybe other program will be able to read it, right? So again, they didn't have powerful programming languages back then, but this is a meaningful way to abstract multiple types behind a single interface, right? Agree? Not bad. Okay. And so each process can either open a file, create a pipe, we'll talk about how to do this, or duplicate an existing file descriptor and get a, another number which points internally to the same file. Question. No, each one will have its own. That's kind of important, right? So we'll we'll talk like it will come up again, but good question. 
Okay, so, and this is your interface for, for example, for how to read a file. So you first open, and then you do a read system call, which takes the same number which you opened before. If you try to pass a number which you never opened, the read will return an error because it says, look, I like there is nothing in this array. So you don't have to, an object, a file object in which you can implement this operation. And read takes two arguments. So for example, a pointer to a buffer in which you're going to do a read and a number of bytes to read from a file, right? Similar for write, right? And this is actually read and write are also part of the operating system interface, right? And this is, I mean, you've seen it, obviously, if you took something like a programming, uh, like a C programming language class or in C++, maybe it's abstracted behind the, the streams, right? In Python, I think you can get access to files, but rarely, but that's the interface. And it's it's okay, right? It's it's not it's not as bad. And then, okay, what I'm, like, I'm missing here is that if you, if you're done working with a file, you can close it, right? <laughs> so, that's really just the going first to the table and then going to read the file object. Correct. So, again, good question. So, and later on, we will have a a series of lectures on file systems, right? So the file systems themselves are kind of tricky because they have to implement this property, which was called consistency. So if we lose a power, we reboot and somehow the file system is still in a state which makes sense, right? And imagine it, you lose power in between two updates, like you did one and was about to do the second one, but you crashed, right? And so file systems implement like a lot of layers, like buffering, uh, transactional layer, which essentially says, okay, it's either happened or not. So internally they are complicated, but to answer your question, when you read and pass this number in a system called read, right? The, the operating system looks at your file descriptor table, looks at what is there in the array under the index three. It's a pointer to a data structure, which let's say struct file. And you say, well, it's a read operation. It's open, so there will be a pointer to which will let the file system to access the disk and read the specific bit, like set of bits which you're requesting. So at this, that's how it works at a high level. Does it make sense or, yeah. So, but you never access the object directly. So you cannot say, let me modify the field of this struct file. But by invoking those uh, system calls, you can advance the pointer within the file from which you're reading and stuff like that, right? Any other questions? Okay, so good with files. This is an example of, to answer your question, that each process will have its own file descriptor table, right? So for example, here, this one is, uh, the green one is a cat. Uh, does anyone know what cat is? Correct, so again, so if I do cat of, the same file text uh, acknowledgements here. It will, man, it's actually a very short file. It's one liner. I do not acknowledge anyone in my papers, right? So why would I? Let me show you something more meaningful. Well, we attacks, right? So it's like a ton of text. It will, again, remember they had a printer like part of it. They say, look, if you really want to print something on a screen and save it, take it home use the cat and that will, will do it right for you. So cat is a program. Uh, and so this one has a, a pointer like or a file descriptor three and inside the a file descriptor table, there will be a pointer to a file which stores the content of the ls.c in a file system, right? And the second blue process, uh, this one is my word count application, which I invoked as uh, wc minus l. Uh, it counts the number of lines in the file wc.c in x with six, which implements the, the wc functionality, right? So what I'm doing here, so if I move from this into something like uh, into the source code of uh, of the x with six itself, I have multiple versions. So if I do cat of wc.c, this will this is the actual implementation of word count application. You, I mean, 
again, it's it's surprising that you it almost fits on one screen, right? So, and if you want to count the number of lines, say do something like this, and it will show me. Uh, man, what is that? C. Uh, it says fifty four lines in that file, right? So that's what this stuff is doing, right? And they have uh, two different file descriptor tables, right? Makes sense because each program will open its own file, do something on it and stuff like that, right? Any questions? Uh, so each file is just a table, it's like in this file. No, uh, entry, you, each, each file descriptor table entry, so an element of the array, will have a pointer to a data structure which represents a single file. <clears throat> Why do we have multiple? No, like, again, uh, <laughs> philosophically, it's a great question. Look, so technically speaking, we can say that a operating system kernel will have a single file descriptor table, right? And then each process will, like all processes in the system will share this table, right? So you say, you know, the first one opens gets three, second opens gets four, fifth comes and opens maybe gets five, right? That's okay. There are some problems with that. Can you guess, guess which ones? Uh, this way, it would have brought that on many, many uh, numbers, right? Large. Right. First of all, you say, look, uh, it's no kind of, if even if each process has its own file descriptor table, conceivably you can run out of entries, right? If you open a ton of files, right? Uh, but what if they, and the same can happen in, in, a, in a single shared one, right? But I'm trying to ask, there is like this design quirk, which if you, if you're sharing a single table, you kind of lose a specific property. Which one? Great argument. So what, what you're saying, what your classmate is saying is that, look, if we do not enforce rules that you can only open your own file descriptor tables, then the green one can access a file of a blue one, right? And maybe it's my bank account. You say, look, but maybe we can enforce this isolation rule somehow else. But uh, really, then you will end up with another access control table, which tells you which files you can access and which one you cannot, right? So this is argument number one, one of the strongest arguments that this, the private nature of this file descriptor table ensures isolation. You can only, you can only access the files which you opened, right? There is a second argument here. The second, can you guess? The second is like, there is this convention. I mean, I don't know how to explain it well, but there is this convention that imagine you wanna, when you start a program and the program doesn't know which file descriptors are open, right? But you say, look, uh, I want it to be able to, con to immediately connect to the standard input and standard output, right? And you can make this convention saying, okay, file descriptor zero will be always opened or created by the shell to point to the standard, uh, what? Input or output, I forgot. Do you guys remember? Good, so standard input, right? And then every program which essentially starts, if you wanna start printf, internally, you don't even have to deal with the file descriptor Externally, you don't have to deal with the file descriptor, but internally, the printf will say, okay, I will send the output to, let's say, standard output or standard error, which is file descriptor number two, and will like, start logging immediately. You can implement this idea by, instead of introducing a well-known number like 012, a well-known name, you can say, well, like in those C libraries, you've, you've seen STDR and standard, standard input, standard output, standard error, right? So then when the program starts, you know, some initialization routine says, okay, I'm gonna open this common name from a file system, right? So that's another way to implement it, right? They didn't do it this, they didn't do it this way. So they said, okay, the numbers is good enough of a convention. So zero, one, and two are special. It's a standard input, output, and error, right? 
But isolation is probably a better argument for why would you have a, a separate table per, per process. Again, good question, because it's not immediately clear why would you make this design choice, right? But, uh, and I mean, it's, it's a little ironic because with my students, we build those operating systems. And again, looking back, everything looks very, very simple, but somehow you, you, are, you have this design choice, like, which we have to do to, from today to tomorrow because we're running out of time. And we say, look, a single table or private tables, not with respect to file descriptors, with respect to something else, whatever we implement it on this specific day. And then, you know, you have to have a feeling for why would you do go one way or another? Because if not, then you, you're going to fail two weeks later because you run into this isolation problem and have to backtrack and rebuild, right? So uh, interesting that it works this way. So you had a question as well, or did... No, uh, they can become duplicates on specific system calls like fork, for example, because fork will copy. I will talk about it later. But right now, think of them as completely different instances, have nothing in common. So is it a coincidence that that one is four and three? That right. It's three. just a coincidence, yeah. Just for illustration. Probably a better example would be maybe to put three and to, and to illustrate the point that both of them open three, but it points to two different files, right? I don't know why I chose this way. Okay, good. So we got the file descriptor. So you will see more of them. So it's important to have this idea. And they will spur, again, the way those guys, uh, uh, Thompson and Ritchie were designing the system, they have a specific semantic meaning and specific rules about them. So uh, we'll, we'll get to this. Okay, cool. So uh, again, I, I already mentioned that. So how do we read something from a, from a keyboard or write something on the screen. So this idea is abstracted by the console interface, right? So I said that they made a convention that uh, this three descriptors, three file descriptors are special. Uh, standard input, essentially, if you do a, uh, what is this function, which, okay, maybe printf is a better example for simplicity. So printf by default goes to file descriptor one, it's a standard output, right? And there is also standard error because maybe output interacts with a student, oh, sorry, not with a student, with a user. And the standard error goes to some kind of a system logging facility to log what's going on, right? So, but this again, convention that the program by default reads from uh, zero writes to one is a useful convention, which will allow us to implement a specific idea of IR redirection in a second. Okay, so what happens underneath, as I was trying to explain before, is that really, instead of a file, there will be a device driver, which is called a console, sitting behind this file descriptor. And again, this is a, back then it was a super powerful abstraction because it survived like five decades, right? So polymorphism of this interface, you say read from zero, but you can either read from a file or you can read from a console, depending on which object is sitting behind this instance of zero, right? Or entry, entry number zero, right? And you can actually close console and open the file and still continue reading or writing to zero, right? And it will work, right? And it's just that the, instead of a file, you will go to a console. Agree? Okay. So, so again, standard input is zero, standard output is one, and that's a convention. So typically when you start a program, you can imagine that this is exactly where your input and output are connected. And so for example, I mentioned this cat program, right? So and I, we, we, we've seen it, it was 54 lines of code, but if you really say, I wanna write a program which prints the content of a file on the standard output or Really, in this specific example, it reads from the standard input, right? So this is the convention here at line four. It reads from zero because it says, okay, look, I, I will follow the convention. Whatever my standard input is, I will read from there. Uh, I skip the lines which op open zero, but okay, zero is typically open when you start, right? And here the logic is very simple. You say, look, if I read nothing and a zero, then I will break out of this infinite loop. If I 
if n is negative, it means that read return an error. Maybe I'm trying to read something which doesn't exist. Maybe the file doesn't exist. And I will output in line eight uh, to the standard error saying read error and exit immediately. So terminate myself with an exit system call. Uh, but if everything went fine and I read some number of bytes and is larger than zero and is not negative, like larger than zero, right? Then I will print out to the standard output, right? So with the right system call, which says, okay, well, I assume that the standard output is open, our descriptor one is open, there might be an error, and if anything, I will report. But other than that, this is the logic of this program. So it's relatively simple. So back then it probably felt like, you know, the power of the Python ecosystem. You say, look, I wanna open a spreadsheet and start doing SQL queries against the spreadsheet. So you get something like pandas, right? And suddenly it works. You don't know anything about databases or about spreadsheets, but it just like, you know, five lines of the code, you can like, you can yeah. build queries and say, what is the like entry with the largest salary or something like that, right? And it's similar here. So it's a, look, I, it's a very simple program. It reads from the standard input, outputs to the standard output, right? Useful because it was printing maybe books or something for listings of programs on the terminal, right? Uh, so we, we got it. This is how it works. This is how you used to write the program back then, right? And it's still like, it's it, it, it kind of makes sense. Okay, we we understood the input and output. We, we know files a little bit, right? We say open a file, file descriptor, read, write. We, we get the idea of how the input and output might work with this console interface, right? Our next step is to understand how we can create processes, right? So again, if I ask you a question, uh, if I ask you a question, as a system designer, what interface you would implement to support creation of a process? What will it be? If you're a normal person, not create. Create, yeah, I agree. Create is so natural. What kind of arguments it will take? Probably name of what you want to create, but what? Yeah, pass to the program which you want to create, right? This is where your compiler compiled that program like this WC or CAT or whatnot, right? And whatever arguments, agree. Well, this is your HPC background. So you want to limit the program to a specific amount of memory and the CPU. Uh, I think it's a wrong design choice for designing those interfaces which take like 55 arguments, right? You cannot even get them right. So I would say just create with a pass, maybe some minimal arguments, but maybe none, right? And just let it run and maybe there will be some other configuration interface which allow you allows will allow you to limit the amount of memory this program can consume later. This is like simplicity first kind of pays back, right? Create. I agree with you, let's do create, but those guys did not. So instead they came up with this idea that they're gonna be using fork. It's very unusual. Fork is like, uh, it's like from a movie. It clones the process. Like literally when, if you have a line which invokes fork system call and I'm running this green shell is my user program, right? Runs on top of a kernel, you invoke fork. And the operating system will create you an identical copy, same variables, same stack, everything. The only difference is that in the parent, the one which calls for, you will receive the process ID of the child. So this is 32, and inside the child, you will get zero. That's the only difference. And now you have two copies of fork, right? Two, oh, sorry, two copies of shell running. They are absolutely identical. The next line will decide whether they diverge. You can check for the uh, return value of 32 in one, zero in another, and do something different, right? So it's effectively if a way to create a new program in Unix is to clone an existing one. It's unusual, right? Why would you do that? Can anyone tell me why? Or maybe other question? Right. So I will I will explain in a second. And and maybe this partially the answer to the question which I was asking. Why would you do that? 
But uh, can anyone maybe guess why they made this choice? It's a very unusual choice, like literally, like I, I'm like you. When I first saw it, I think, okay, this is crazy. I really wanted to create. Windows has create. Those guys built Fork. Easy. Wow. <laughs> the homework will show whether it's easy or not. It's a little harder than you think. So any uh, other ideas? One point is that because uh, it's, uh, it's like uh, Karen or Charles, they will have something similar. So it makes sense for them to work in. Right. So what you think is that imagine you are so clever that you create a new instance of an Apache web server for each request. You have an incoming request and you say, look, but I'm so paranoid that I will get exploited, that I will create a completely isolated copy of Apache and it will run this request and there is an ex exploit, maybe the attack will be limited to that copy, right? Back then they didn't think about it yet. It, the security argument came, came later. So there is no meaningful, like really, no, no real justification yet to like in our discussion yet to, to understand why we, we need this cloning. So you had an idea? But why would you, you like ultimate goal, to, goal is to have a something like a create, something a fresh copy of something completely different. Why would they do a clone? If you're creating a cell, maybe cell wants to support, but before the child calls it or starts a new program, it wants to configure itself a little back and forth. Correct. Correct. So I will like again. Uh, my goal was to kind of provoke you a little. You gave the right answer. Instead of reiterating this answer for everyone, I'll just use my slide deck and we'll get there to it in a second. A one-liner is that the shell, the end goal with this child is that it will be running something else. It will be running WC, for example. But for a short window of time after the shell cloned itself and before replacing the memory of this child process with WC, the shell is in control. And specifically, it can reconfigure file descriptors and implement an idea which is called IR redirection. And I will explain those ideas like right now, right? Any questions or we're good for now to go forward? Um, does the shell no, child returns zero, right? And parent gets the PAD of a child. Okay, but let me just again illustrate how you can use the fork. So this is a short sequence which says, okay, line two, we do a fork. Uh, at this point, two instances of this program are running after fork returns. Inside the parent, the PAD is larger than zero. So I print out here that I'm a parent and my child ID is such and such. And then what I do is I use this wait system call for the child to finish. Just, you don't have to, you can run in parallel, but in this specific case, and this is what the shell is doing, I will wait. The shell does it because if the shell immediately outputs the command prompt and the child is printing like crazy, this command prompt will be just overwritten and lost, and then you will never get it again, right? So the shell typically waits for the child to finish all the output and then prints the next command prompt, right? And then it's like, oops, nights on the screen, and you understand what's going on. At line seven, you say, look, if the PAD is zero, I'm inside the child. So I print on the screen that I'm a child. And then I just exit with an exit system call, right? There might be a case of an error. For example, a operating system ran out of memory and cannot create an, a clone of the process, right? And then it returns a negative number. So it's my last else statement at line 11. I think I, I print that fork failed, right? Okay. so. Relatively easy, and this this kind of a code you're gonna write when you implement the shell, or, or people who did the shell already, they wrote it, right? But back to this question, is it is very weird that you know you're just cloning the same process multiple times, right? And I was trying to like uh, ask you, right? So okay, so they understood the weirdness because you cannot create uh, go far away with just cloning itself. So they introduced a new system call which is called Exact. Exact is almost equally as weird as, as fork, right? So what it does is just 
replaces the image, the memory image of a program with a new program. So for example, here I say, well, my end goal is to execute an echo. Echo is a program which just echoes the argument on the, on the screen. So if I do something like foo, it will print me foo back, right? Not a very useful program, but there are like use cases, right? So, and uh, well, we know that remember C uh, main, main takes this array of uh, pointers, this RV, it's a size of three. And so it would say, look, uh, there will be like three, two arguments. And the third one is dimensionally zero saying that that's the last, uh, that's the end of the argument array. And the arguments essentially the name of the program itself and the string I want to print on a, on a, on a screen. So conceptually what I'm doing here is echo hello. That's exactly what this program is trying to do, right? So essentially we'll print hello on a screen. And the operating system allows you to do that with this exact system call, which says, okay, here's a path to the program where in the file system slash bin slash echo, there is a copy of an echo, echo program, pass this argument array, arg v, that's the argument to the exact system call, and this will be passed by the operating system to that program and execute it, right? And note, I, I don't even check for the error code, but Obviously, since exact replaces the memory of the program, this printf line should not execute in case everything goes right, right? But if I reach that line, it means that exact actually failed. I should probably read the argument, uh, read the error code and say, look, we failed for whatever reason, but I, just for simplicity, I don't do it here, right? Again, let me illustrate. So imagine the parent shell first called fork, got 32, Inside the child, again, we are executing the next line after fork in both programs, right? That's, I mean, or if you like, next instruction pointer, but let's say next line. So this exact WC just completely wipes out the memory of this child shell, right? This is what the operating system is doing. And it turns into, like, essentially, it starts from the main of WC, right? And that's what we're like. That's that's how you really create WC. So you first fork yourself and then immediately do exact, right? A little unusual, but at least we got to the functionality of create, right? Any questions about how it works? So exact replaces all the files for the agent which is immune. That's a great, very great question. So it does replace the page table because uh, it's a new memory image completely. Like forget about the old one, it all gets deallocated. And with, when you deallocate, you really like uh, deallocate parts of the page table. Like it's good that you got this idea from the introduction lecture. And we will look at the actual implementation of fork and exact in XV6, right? But the file descriptors are special and they leave them intact, which is a little unusual. Again, this collection of rules, which somehow works together, but I will explain why. Right, but that's a great question. So file descriptors are actually intact. So they they it doesn't do anything. Is that the only right? The only I think, right, yeah. Okay. Again, back to the weirdness question. So why is it we're doing it? And to explain why, we need to understand this idea which they had a back, back then, which is still a powerful idea. It's the idea of IO redirection. So let me illustrate it through an example. So normally this WC sends it output to the console, right? So remember, I, I, I showed you the code of cat and cat was just printing to standard output, right? So file descriptor, what, one, right? Uh, and it's fine. So you type something like WC minus L, ls.c, it outputs on a console. What if we, for whatever reason, want to redirect this output into a file just to save it? Or maybe save a save whatever ink on that printer which those guys had. So how can we build this interface? Well, like we say, well, whatever, minus O, like specify the output, right? And provide a file name, foobar.txt. Totally works, right? But they decided, okay, let's go for a little bit of ergonomics and say, 
we will have a standard way in a shell to redirect output with this special symbol, right? So essentially, this uh, this symbol. So shell is a language, like you know, Python is a language, C is a language. Shell interprets a very simple language. Well, today it's a little bit better than back then, but I actually don't know what, what was the original shell. But this is one symbol in a language, right? It says, okay, if I invoke it like that, just make sure that my output goes. Let me just highlight this wonderful symbol. Oh, wrong. Right? Greater than. So greater than redirects out. So if you say something like WC minus L, uh, ls.c greater than foobar, the output goes to foobar. Note that this does not require any change inside of the WC itself. It still prints to one. It's just the shell takes care and says that one will no longer point to the console, but will point to that specific file, right? That seems like a decent idea. And it works for any program. And the symbol less than redirects input. So essentially, if you say, instead of reading from the uh, keyboard from the console, please read from the file, ls.c, right? So just pick up this again, again, you don't have to change the program. And of course you can redirect both. Like in my example at the bottom, you say wc takes an input from ls.c and outputs into foobar.txt. It's, in, it's interesting because it's like, it provides a certain degree of composability. You say, I have this very simple tool. One counts lines, one prints something, one maybe filters, and I will explain it in a second. And suddenly I have like a more powerful interface to interact with the system, right? It's almost like SQL, but not, not there yet, right? And uh, if I illustrate this with the my power descriptor table, so essentially what happened here is if you, redirect both input and output, they both point to a file, potentially even to the same file, right? In my example, it was two different files on this picture, it's one, right? But this is how your uh, file descriptor table will look like in the kernel, right? Again, you can redirect into different things, like into pipes, become clear soon why, and a console and device, like devices like console and files, right? Again, same cat, nothing needs to be changed because we always read from zero, right, to one. We don't have to handle this minus O uh, argument, right? So just leave it as is. It makes sense. If I push this argument a little bit forward and I will, you, you, maybe you, you still not, not really can, can, can convinced that we need this IO redirection. Let me just give you another motivating example. Let's imagine we want to see how many strings in ls.c contain the word main, the word main, right? So ls.c is a C implementation of the uh, of the ls program. So most likely it will contain one instance of main, right? You say, okay, cool. Uh, we can say, look, uh, I will. There's another tool, grab, which works as a filter. So it takes an input and just filters the strings which contain a specific substring. In this example, it's main. So if I type it in, it will print back the string from ls.c, which is main. So let me uh, illustrate it, grab main ls.c, right? So on my screen, let me just make it larger. It actually outputs the same as on the slide, right? So, okay, cool. Uh, we can write it with an input redirection, doesn't matter. What if we have a little bit more complicated example, which is more realistic? So for example, you say, uh, we wanna count those lines, right? So maybe we wanna see how many integers we have in a program, right? And we say, we'll grab for all integers and then, and then what is it you're gonna do, right? You either have to write a new program which filters and counts at the same time, or you try to compose those two existing programs, right? And they went with the route, they went the route of composing, which, which Proof, like, which over the period of five decades, like, uh, worked out quite well, right? So they said, okay, we introduce another symbol in this language of the shell. The single, the symbol will be called a pipe. This vertical line. It means that it essentially redirects output of the left side of the pipe to the program which runs on the right. So in this specific example, 
instead of redirecting into a file, we're connecting those two programs. So I cat ls.c, outputting all the lines from ls.c into this something what is called the pipe, and the graph reads from that pipe, right? So in a more world, what it can resemble, maybe something like, like modern data flow AI tools, which allow you to compose multiple blocks together and essentially, I don't know, maybe like implement a specific workflow, right? You see those two still, but they're more sophisticated. You connect inputs and outputs. Everything is like more automated. But back then, that was still a very powerful idea. So for example, uh, this really just essentially connects the output of ls of cat into grab right and you can you can imagine that this kind of works uh in a generic way so meaning that uh you can connect anything to anything right and uh essentially implement those tiny more sophisticated programs from multiple bits of uh, from multiple small programs so I probably should stop here. So we will we will start next time with pipe. I'll explain how it works, what pipes is, what pipe is. I will finish this example of convincing you that okay, this composition of uh, with pipes makes sense, and then we will essentially finish the operating system interface on Thursday. Uh, okay. So then, thank you. So I'll stop here. We'll see you Thursday. Yep.